Uh, welcome to lecture 22, uh, history 2111, the first half of U.S. history. We talked about the code of honor last time. Of course, this takes place uh, in the Burr-Hamilton duel uh, taking place in 1804, uh, right in the middle of the uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson administration. Uh, Jefferson was served two terms, uh, elected in 1800 and then again in 18, uh, 1805. Uh, I want to concentrate on just two things during the Jeffersonian um, uh, time period. And quite often historians use the term the Jeffersonian era uh, to point to more than just Jefferson's two terms. Uh, sometimes uh, James Madison and James Monroe's uh, terms are kind of lumped in with this Jeffersonian era. But here we're going to talk about um, Lewis and Clark, uh, their expedition in the Louisiana Territory, and we're going to talk about uh, Jefferson's embargo uh, in his second term against the, uh, the warring parties in Europe. So uh, let's start with Lewis and Clark, and I want to give you context first, and there's more than one. Uh, first context is uh, the exploration of the American West. Included in this is the search uh, for the legendary Northwest Passage. Uh, Jefferson, uh, running back into history all the way to Columbus, uh, believed that there was a water route through North America whereby you could um, reach North America from the east on the Atlantic, sail through the continent into the Pacific, and then on to the riches of China. Uh, in the markets in Asia. Uh, Columbus looked for this, other explorers looked for it. Uh, in the early 19th century, Thomas Jefferson still held out hope that the great, or the mysterious Northwest Passage existed. So that was one of the purposes of, uh, of this expedition. Uh, a second context is the encounter between the Americans and the Indians west of the Mississippi River. Um, a third context, who did this land belong to? Uh, we have this image of Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon Bonaparte doing a real estate deal whereby Napoleon grants Jefferson the, uh, this territory in exchange for $15 million. Uh, did either one of these men uh, have any rights to this territory? Uh, we sometimes view the Louisiana Territory as being empty, uh, much like um, uh, the myth of the pristine continent, uh, which we talked about, we talked about American exceptionalism, as North America being empty, just waiting for the European Christians to arrive. And of course this is nonsense. Uh, the Louisiana Territory uh, was full of people, a variety of Indian nations, uh, Frenchmen, uh, Englishmen, Russians, uh, Spanish, uh, so on and so forth. So whose land is this? Um, you get the sense that what Jefferson purchased from Napoleon uh, was the legal right to explore this territory and to make a claim for it. So we have these larger contexts to keep in mind. Uh, I want to give you a couple of signif significances here. Uh, Lewis and Clark, this expedition of the Corps of Discovery, it establishes an American presence across the North American continent. Uh, it begins the establishment of American sovereignty across this continent over both Indian nations and European competitors. Uh, another significance, the Lewis and Clark expedition proved the feasibility of an overland route to the far west. It added a great deal of scientific knowledge as uh, the Corps of Discovery uh, encountered new animals, new plants, and of course, Jefferson, as a, sort of the ultimate Renaissance man, uh, enjoyed very much um, receiving these packages uh, with um, these specimens. And of course, uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition will stimulate uh, what we would later refer to as manifest destiny. In fact, you could think of Lewis and Clark as the sharp point of that longer spear that we might call manifest destiny, that drive westward to the Pacific. The purpose of the expedition, uh, according to Jefferson uh, in his notes to uh, Meriwether Lewis, his secretary, he says, quote, to explore the Missouri River and by its course in communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean, 
uh, that may offer the most direct and practical water communication across the continent uh, for the purpose of commerce and to learn as much as possible about the life and culture of the Indians who lived along this route and who were crucial to the success of the fur trade, uh, the principal commerce that the president referred to. And again, the fur trade is a long-standing trade. We saw this when we talked about the middle ground uh, with the French and the uh, Huronian Indians in, uh, in New France, what today we would call Canada. Uh, the fur trade uh, uh, was uh, certainly a lure for French colonists, and here Jefferson is still seeking uh, connections with a lucrative fur trade with the Indians of this area. Uh, a bit of chronology. Uh, in January of 1803, Jefferson requested funds from the Congress uh, to uh, finance this expedition. Uh, the expedition, of course, is called the, uh, uh, the Corps of Discovery, led by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. There are 48 other people, including interpreters, uh, they began their ascent up the Missouri River in May of 1804. Uh, they crossed the Rockies in April of 1805. And in November of 1805, the Corps of Discovery comes within sight of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the expedition will return to St. Louis in September of 1806. So this is about two years uh, total for the, uh, the time uh, to travel all the way to the Pacific and then back again. Now let's characterize the core of discovery a bit. The uh, Lewis and Clark recognizing that reciprocity uh, was a key part of Indian culture took with them uh, various trinkets to trade with the Indians. Uh, metals and needles and mirrors and ribbons and just a variety of, of, of junk really. Um, the, with the understanding that the Indians would uh, find some usefulness in this stuff and might exchange food or information or aid in some way for these trinkets. Of course, we see this going all the way back to Columbus. Remember, Columbus was amazed that the, uh, that the Indians would give a lot uh, for what Columbus considered uh, just junk lying around the boat. Uh, so this Western sort of stereotype of Indian ignorance of the value of things continues on here. Um, impediments for the Corps of Discovery. I'm going to mention a few. Um, the Missouri River in summer after the, uh, after the uh, winter snows had melted. Uh, you get into late summer and early fall, the Missouri River becomes quite shallow. And this, of course, requires uh, the men of the Corps of Discovery to uh, take their boats and barges out of the river and march them overland until they reach some deep uh, point in the river where the boats could then uh, be reintroduced to the river. Portage, this is called. Can you imagine unloading these barges, carrying all the gear and the barges upriver, overland, until you can find a deep point uh, to get back into the river? So in late summer and early fall, you face this problem. And then, of course, in, um, in spring and early summer, you face the problem of flooding as the Missouri River uh, collects all the melting snows, uh, creating a flooding hazard. So here again, uh, you may have to pull your boats out of the water uh, to keep from being um, overturned. Other impediments, uh, in the brief summers here, you find the emergence of black flies and mosquitoes that will eat you alive. I think we talked about this again during the, uh, uh, the middle ground in, our, in a few lectures ago. And of course, they encounter a new uh, and very aggressive species of bear, uh, the grizzly bear. Uh, the men of the Corps of Discovery uh, discovered that even direct hits with their muskets uh, would often uh, be ineffectual. Uh, these bears were territorial and aggressive, and uh, sometimes it would take multiple shots to slow one of these bears down or to kill it. Let's talk about ownership here for a moment as we further characterize Lewis and Clark. Jefferson urged Lewis and Clark to um, carve their names on rocks and trees, uh, to leave traces of themselves as they move through the territory, to make improvements on the land if possible, uh, to name things, name the creeks, name the rivers, name the mountains, uh, give them American names. Again, 
This is just a uh, good real estate practice in establishing your presence on the land. Of course, if you can establish your presence on the land, then you begin to establish ownership of the land. Uh, let's continue with this idea of ownership. And I touched on this earlier. Uh, many Frenchmen live there. Uh, many Indians live there. And as the Americans come through this territory, uh, these French and these Indians and others uh, are not going to recognize them as establishing sovereignty over this land. This is going to be a contested uh, area for some time. So ownership is still ambiguous, uh, even as Lewis and Clark move through the territory. I want to talk about the Indian point of view here for a moment. And I'll, I'll, let me give you a quote from one of the Indian, one of the Indian chiefs. He says, quote, we had philosophy laws, order, and religion. We were not uncivilized or wild. We lived according to our laws and the order established in our homes and homeland." Unquote. This, of course, is uh, uh, part of the ongoing struggle between the white Christians and the Native Americans as Europeans and the Americans view the Indians as savage because they're not Christian. They view them as barbarians because of their, uh, their dress and their culture is quite different from Western Europeans and Americans. And the Indians, of course, do not see it this way at all. They view their culture as superior, their religion as superior, uh, their gendered roles as superior to the white men. So this is a constant uh, and ongoing struggle between the two sides. Of course, the, uh, the ultimate tragedy for the Indians is that they will simply be removed uh, and shunted onto reservations, their culture destroyed. The um, uh, Jefferson, of course, had in the back of his mind two ideas regarding the Indians. One, a simulation, uh, whereby the Indians would become more and more like white Christians. Or two, annihilation, uh, whereby the Indians would simply be moved aside uh, to make way for superior white culture. Uh, I want to just make a, uh, one remark here about Sacagawea. Uh, most people are familiar with this legendary figure, young Indian maiden, who accompanied Lewis and Clark um, on their expedition west. Uh, it's interesting that Sacagawea had originally um, lived in, uh, in the Rocky Mountains and had, as a young girl, traveled eastward to the Mandan village where Lewis and Clark uh, first found her. Uh, so she had a memory of the route, uh, having already traced it once as much younger, uh, a younger girl. So she was very helpful in, in taking Lewis and Clark along that route westward this time. And she, of course, has gone down in history much in the way of um, uh, Pocahontas in, uh, in Virginia as a mediator between uh, the savage Indians and the civilized whites. Also, from the Indian point of view, think about uh, the fact that Lewis and Clark, for the Indians, just looked like another group of white men moving through the territory. Uh, the Indians would have no way of knowing that their way of life uh, uh, was now tick, tick, ticking away, uh, and Lewis and Clark are the beginning of the end for these Western Indians. Again, I want you to think of Lewis and Clark as sort of the spearhead of Manifest Destiny. So let's draw some conclusions here. Uh, this expedition, this core of discovery, it established or at least staked a claim uh, for the American Republic all the way to the Pacific Ocean. It advanced scientific knowledge, geographical knowledge. It allowed us to create a map uh, that could uh, accurately depict much of the continent. It is a forerunner of Manifest Destiny, uh, which will emerge in full flower in the 1840s. And I think it's safe to say it's the beginning of the end of the middle ground. Um, the middle ground, of course, had already ended east of the Mississippi uh, in many places. Uh, this is the beginning of the end of the middle ground west of the Mississippi, as the indigenous peoples of the uh, North American continent are now going to be, uh, become diminished and decline. Thank you.